Do you remember learning long division? I don't know about you, but that chapter in my math career severely reduced my love of mathematics. It was this long procedure. I didn't understand why we were supposed to do each of these parts. It was boring, long, and arbitrary. And looking back at the procedure a few years later, and even as an adult, I realized, I don't understand how this works. I don't understand how it gets the right answers. Now, it turns out that if we try to replicate the process with Roman numerals, it's actually easier to understand specifically how long division works. So let's follow a hypothetical story of how long division could have been invented here on Inductica. Uh. Motivation one. We'll start our story with a flashback. Earlier in his life, remember, Rom lived in the woods with his wife and children. Sometimes on his way back from a trip towards town, towards the town of Babel, he would bring a bag of candies back for his seven children. Now, to be fair, he wanted to make sure that all of his children were getting the same number of candies. So that led Rom to the following question. How can I distribute the candies in a way which gives gives an equal number of candies to each child. Investigation one. Rom decided that he could be fair if he doled the candies out one at a time. He made sure to give the candies in order every single time. The first child not receiving a second candy until every single child got at least one. And of course, the first child doesn't get a third candy until every child has received two, etc. He's going to continue on with this process of doling them out. In this third round of doling out, he finds that only his first two children got candies, and then he ran out of candies. What that means is, is that these two kids got one candy extra. They got three, everyone else got two. Probably had to fight with them a little bit, but he took those two candies back from those two kids to make sure everyone got the same number, and he's just going to destroy distribute those two candies later. Those two would be a remainder. Conclusion one, when one wants to split a group into a number of equal groups, one allocates units of the group to each of the subgroups, one at a time, until all the units have been allotted. One then removes one unit from the groups, if any, that received one more than the other groups. These extra units are set aside as the remainder. This is a flashback because it ends up being helpful in Rom's later years when he is recruited into the military. So let's fast forward to the present day where Babel is once again at war with the tribe of Mosul. And the way this war started is that traders from the land of Babel traveled to Mosul in hopes of making a profit there on the benevolent assumption that these are people too, they'll wanna trade with us. But unknown to them, the Mosul had not developed as a people in the way that the Babel had. The Mosul themselves once had traders, and they benefited from the fact that these traders traveled to nearby villages and got goods that the people in Mosul couldn't get and brought them back and sold them for a profit. And of course, the people of Mosul also benefited from this trade. They got goods they ordinarily could not get. But what ended up happening is, is that this caused a lot of envy among the Mosul people. And so after a while, the Mosul people ended up developing a religious viewpoint that a trader doesn't add anything to an exchange, that all he does is basically scam people because he's making money off of not really creating something. And so they latched on to this rationalization, you know, ignoring the fact that they are creating something, they're creating the value of bringing these goods in from other places. And so they used this view as a rationalization for their envy and soon executed all of their traders. And being a trader of this kind became illegal among the Mosul people. This, of course, led to their economy completely stagnating. And so the Babel traders suffered the same fate. They had their goods stolen from them and they were executed. Now, desiring more of this unearned loot, the leaders of the Mosul people sent a raiding party to Babel to steal more goods. This raid left several dead, and so the Sargon of Babel 
declared war immediately on the tribe of Mosul. Now, during this war effort, Rom volunteers, not as a soldier, but as a supplier. He knew that he could be of benefit to the army by keeping it well supplied. And the way he helped the war effort was by using his experience as a trader. He took routes that were usually unseen by Mosul troops. And during this first journey, he was able to completely avoid any of the Mosul troops wandering around. He reaches the Babel army that has already made its way deep inside Mosul territory at this point. And so when he reaches the army, the general explains to Rom that he has five and and four platoons under his command, and that he would like Rom to distribute all of the goods he has just brought equally among all of these platoons. So Rom knows that he has two hundreds, fifty, and two ten crates. Somehow he has to figure out how to distribute those crates among five and four platoons. And so he thinks, well, maybe I could just distribute it like I distributed the candy among my children all those years ago. He thinks about that idea, but he realized that's gonna take some time. So that leads him to the following question. Is there a faster way to allocate crates to each of these platoons? Investigation two. So doling's gonna take too long. So Rom thinks, what if I doled out lots of them at a time? Like what if I were to give each platoon two, 10 and five crates all at once? Well, if I did that, how many would I have left to distribute? Well, I could just work that out on paper is what Rom realizes. Well, he could work it out on papyrus. First, what he's gonna do on papyrus is he's going to figure out how many he doles out if he were to give each platoon two, 10, and five crates. And so to do that, he's going to do multiplication. He's gonna multiply five and four by two, 10, and five. And that's the number of crates he'll distribute in total if he were to give each platoon two, 10, and five crates. And of course, multiplication, this uses an earlier induction, which is Roman numeral multiplication. So to multiply, this is a review from the last video, he's going to multiply each numeral in the first number by each numeral of the second number. And so if you wanna work out that process, I've shown it on the board and you can pause the video so you can follow how that was done. He uses the Roman multiplication tables. And at the end, after he condenses all these symbols together, he gets two hundreds, two tens, and five. He has distributed this many crates if he gives each platoon two, 10, and five crates. What that means is that he can use subtraction to actually figure out how many crates he has left to distribute now. So remember he had two hundreds, 50, and two, 10 crates, and he has just distributed two hundreds, two, 10, and five crates. So he's gonna use subtraction. To subtract, he crosses out. Then he has to expand that L so that he can cross out further. And that leads to four, 10, and five crates that he has left to distribute at the end. And just as a reminder, this uses Roman numeral subtraction, which is also from a previous video that you can go back to if you didn't see it. Now he has four, 10, and five crates left to distribute. So he's got to take a guess at how many crates he can distribute to each platoon to distribute the rest of these. So he's going to guess four. He's going to give each platoon four more crates. Let's find out how many that distributes total. If the number's too high, he's going to have to just guess something lower. But let's find out what it comes out to. He does five and four times four. He repeats five, ten, and four four times. And that uses the commutative property of multiplication to make it a little easier for himself. And he condenses all of those numbers into three, ten, five and one crates. So now he's got to subtract again. Remember he had four, 10 and five crates and he has just distributed three, 10, five and one crates. So he uses subtraction. He does some crossing out. This leads to 10 minus one which is five and four. So now he just has five and four left to distribute, which means that each platoon just gets one more crate. And now he has mentally given away all the crates. So in order to find out how many he has to give to each platoon, he looks over his work. In the first allocation, he gave everyone two, 10 and five. Then in the second allocation, he gave everyone four. Then after that, he gave one more. So that's going to be two, 10 and five plus four, plus one. So adding all this up, this is 310. Each platoon is going to get 
310 crates. Now notice that he doesn't actually have to distribute the crates. He can just distribute it in his mind until he figures out a distribution that works. Once he found the distribution that works, you know, giving each platoon 310 crates, he can simply have the platoons count their crates as they take them away. And that makes it much easier for him. He doesn't have to dole them out himself. And so Rom has figured out a way to systematically deal out those crates. In the battle that came afterwards, the Babel crushed the Mosul. The Babel soldiers had superior armor and weapons from their technological advancements that had happened since their last clash with the Mosul. In addition, their soldiers were better fed as a result of a stronger economy and strong supply lines thanks to Ram's effort. The Mosul in this fight took heavy losses and the Babel suffered a few wounded. Now during Ram's next supply run, right before the Babel attacked the main village of the Mosul, the Babel had received more reinforcements Rom is now bringing in more crates. So during this part of the campaign, the general explains to Rom that he has 10 and four platoons, and Rom can see that he has to this time distribute 400s, 50, two tens, five and two crates to each of these platoons. So he's gonna have to do division again. He's gonna do the same method. We're gonna do the same thing we basically did last time, but this time we're gonna organize it with a little bit of structure and refine the method. So Rom draws this little bar thing, and of course the number on the left represents the number of groups he has to split the crates among, and then the number inside the little box represents the total number of crates to be allocated. So Rom is going to start with a guess of how many crates to give each platoon. He's always going to intentionally underestimate how many he thinks he can give out to each platoon. Because if he overestimates, he's going to have to start over. And if he underestimates, he can just subtract and then distribute again. Okay, so his first guess is going to be 310. So he's going to hand each platoon 310 crates this time. They're going to be even better supplied than last time. So he's going to hand everyone 310 crates and he's gonna use multiplication to figure out how many that involves distributing in this first round. So he does 10 and four times 310. Using Roman numeral multiplication, which I'm not gonna go over in detail here, he gets this. He writes that on the bottom right here. Next, he's going to subtract to figure out how many crates are left to distribute. So in order to subtract, he just cancels. And we can see at the end, he has 50, five, and two crates left to distribute. Not bad, it's pretty simple, right? So next, he's again going to underestimate estimate and he's going to guess three. He's going to guess that he can give everyone each platoon three more. He then does three times 10 and four. That gives us a result of four, 10 and two. So he's going to subtract four, 10 and two from 55 and two. That's going to involve expansion first. He's got to expand that number so he can actually cancel the X's. And so now he's able to cancel them all. If you notice, he still has 10 and five less to distribute. So that means he can only give each platoon one more. So he simply adds that one last tally to the top. Once he does this, he knows that he has distributed 10 and four more. So he's got to do subtraction again. And that obviously gives one at the end. He can't distribute one crate among everyone. That's simply left aside as a remainder. Once he tells the general about this distribution, the general decides to simply allocate that crate to his highest performing platoon. Conclusion two. So Rom has figured out a systematic way to dole things out, just like he did with his children, but he's doling out in bulk this time. Now further, he doesn't have to physically dole anything out. He can just use multiplication to figure out how many total he distributes every time he gives everyone, say, 310 then three more, then one more, until he finds the answer. And he can keep track of all of this on paper. So, in general, when a group represented by a dividend is split into equal subgroups, represented by the divisor, and one wishes to know the quantity of units in each subgroup, which is called the quotient, one starts by guessing the quotient. One writes this guess and multiplies it by the divisor. If this number is greater than the dividend, one must start over and make a smaller guess. 
If this number is less than the dividend, which it was in all of our examples, if this is less than the dividend, one subtracts it from the dividend. The difference is then the new dividend and the remaining units to be allotted to each subgroup. Repeat the above process until the difference is less than the divisor. This difference is then the remainder. Add the quotient guesses found during each repetition to find the total quotient. So that is how to do long division in Roman numerals. Now notice how the inductive process, the process of actually tracing out the observations and reasoning steps which prove long division. Notice how this process shows us how long division actually works. It's not an arbitrary process of rote procedures. It's just a systematic way of doling out items equally in bulk bulk using multiplication and subtraction. Notice also in this video a major aspect of induction, that each idea is built off of earlier ideas. We could not come up with a system of long division without first referencing multiplication and subtraction from earlier videos. So as we go on in this inductive journey, we find that each idea we have will be used as a tool to open up new understandings of the world. And this process is going to continue all the way to quantum and relativistic phenomena. And this is exactly the reason I think this whole process is necessary. We need to get our prior context of knowledge in relativistic and quantum phenomena clear if we are to replace those flawed theories of quantum mechanics and general relativity. So if you'd like to join me on the next chapter of this epic inductive journey, hit subscribe or watch the next video to find out how Rom's partner, Ark, invents negative numbers and the concept of zero. I'll see you then. This video is part of a longer series dedicated to reproving the essential ideas of math and physics by showing an actual process of observation and reasoning steps scientists could have taken to prove these conclusions. Observational proofs, also known as inductive proofs, give us a deeper, reality-based understanding of these abstract ideas and demonstrate the proper method of scientific proof. This series starts with cavemen counting rocks and will continue all the way to the frontiers of quantum and relativistic phenomena. This epic story will proceed in a possible order of discovery since science always progresses by reasoning about observations using what has been discovered earlier. To discover the long-term goal and the true power of this project, visit my channel page for more information. To see the playlist for this series or to see my channel, just click on the links on the screen. Finally, if you'd like more lectures like this, just go to patreon.com slash inductica. For just $5 a month, you gain access to the written, rigorous forms of these proofs, as well as my 34-hour lecture series, An Inductive Summary of Physics. I'll see you in the next video as this inductive journey continues.